Hey there, welcome to the Breakthrough Creative. I'm your host, John McDavid. I'm glad that you're back with us this week. And we have a pretty cool guest. Um, we have a cymbal smith. He is a drummer who played and toured with the band all over the world and just found himself falling in love with making cymbals. And when you think about that, you know, I'd never thought about making symbols before. It's like, how do you make a symbol? Do you press it? Do you hammer it? Do you, what do you do? Well, uh, he'll get into that. But what's really cool about my guest, Dave Collingwood, is that he isn't necessarily an engineer. He f figured out a way. He figured out a way to design and to make symbols that sound awesome and help drummers in their performance and he's selling them he's making a, uh, a living as a cymbal smith and so let's go ahead and get into the interview now hi john thanks um yeah okay so i am what's known as an independent cymbal smith which means i make cymbals uh for, for drum kits and i was just explaining and i'll say it for the episode when i say to people i i make cymbals they go oh great you're a graphic designer like like I make S-Y-M-B-O-L-S, but what I do is so niche, people don't expect, oh wait, you can even make symbols? That's crazy. So so yeah, what I do is I, I basically get raw bronze, which I import from Turkey, just in these kind of flat gnarly discs, and I hand hammer them uh, into, you know, into shape with kind of sonic characteristics in mind. And then I've got a lathe, which I built for cutting away the the surface to varying degrees, and it's all very sort of practical in a way whilst being you know musical and and uh, creative as well so you know the first question i actually want to ask is about your lathe mm. um because you know i i my, my father was a, a a machine repairman and so he, he could kind of do a little bit of everything and he would work with metal and he had a lathe we had a three foot lathe as i was growing up and he always wanted to show me how to, you know, put the threads on a screw or how to turn a table leg. And I was not interested as a young child, unfortunately. Yeah. But, you know, you're, I mean, you're talking about, you know, what, 10, 10 inches and larger for, for a symbol? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the largest I've made so far, at least, is 26 inch diameter. Um, so, I mean, that's a pretty big lathe. Well, it's, it's entirely self-built. You can't, you, you sort of can, you can repurpose old turning lathes, but the way I did it, the way I started my whole business was just to kind of start literally building everything. Like I built the workshop pretty much and I built the, the tools. So, so I designed this lathe based around simply getting a motor. Um, and because the RPMs on that particular motor are too high, I had to then get a gearbox to reduce them down and then get a shaft to which you can attach a circular backing plate. And as long as then it's attached to a nice sturdy desk or bench, uh, you've then basically got a spinning plate in front of you. Um, so it's not a lathe per se. It's not like I didn't go through a catalog and buy a lathe. I bought some parts and designed it and built it myself. It's just fascinating because you're, you know, you're, you're not into a, a, a width, you're into a diameter on yes, this yeah. thing or a length you're into a diameter i just so how did you figure out how, how to, are you an engineer or well no uh, well but when i built it i wasn't um i i've always had a kind of practical mind i think that comes from the sort of musician i am i guess and growing up my my granddad him and i he and i were very close and he was a, an engineer at aerospace here in bristol so he worked building concord and and uh, various kind of aircraft so he'd always show me when we'd spend like weekends together how to build little boats, you know, put hammer bits of wood together and cut the right, blah, blah, you know what I mean? That yes. sort of practical approach. And so I've always just tinkered with stuff. And to be honest, I think that's what kind of appealed about symbol making is that there's that tinkering element. So, so it ticks the boxes for me of music, of being a musician and a drummer. Um, and pract practicality, you know, working with my hands. Funnily enough, though, because I used to tour um, in bands as a drummer, and then when I had children, I stopped doing that um, and retrained actually as an electrical engineer. <clears throat> um, so I was doing engineering work, kind of electrical, but I was also installing all the tray and just like ripping up pavements and all that kind of stuff. So that kind of gave me more confidence and knowledge, I guess, just to 
to realize if you want to make something work you just piece it together you know until it works and if it doesn't work go back and find a bit that doesn't work and on you go you know just that approach and from a creative point of view for symbol making that's good as well because you get this kind of process yeah it, it's it's a weird thing to describe but you have there's a process that you have to go through to make a symbol based on parameters you kind of decide at the beginning um and there's that fact finding thing you might make a mistake i made i'm self-taught so it was all through mistakes but then i'd have to go back and say why did that bit of metal not go where i thought it was going to go and then unpick what i'd done which is really hard when you've got a hammer bit of metal in front of you so it just suits my crazy mind i think <laughs> that's that's the long version so let's find out how you got crazy um okay. let's let's go back to the beginning so how how like what was the path to where you're at right now oh gosh um i guess i mean it depends how far back you want to go and how personal you want to get i think i i'm all about sort of seeing the personal as as the sort of driver of I agree. And we're long form. So please, I, I'd love to hear your story. <laughs> well, basically growing up a, a very kind of shy child with a bit of a broken family and, you know, issues like so many people do. I'm not saying there's anything particular, particularly special or whatever about my background. But I, I just remember, I guess the first thing that really took my attention in a big way, it's such a strong memory, was when a, a, um, a neighbor who was sort of my age when I was probably, you know, early teens or something, uh, he got a drum kit and he was a couple of doors away from me and I could just hear him playing and my ears just pricked up and such a strong memory that like, that's something I want to do. I, that's the only thing I've ever thought of that I actually really want to do, just sit and play that thing. And it wasn't that I wanted to learn how to, how to, uh, just do crazy fills and be really technical. I just wanted to express myself in that way. Like I said, I was quite shy, so it sounded like quite a loud way of doing it without having to talk, you know, rightly or wrongly. Anyway, so I did that. I sat to his kit and I just found instantly, he said, right, here's a beat, it might take a while. And I just went, no, I think I got it, you know, and I just had it straight off, just naturally was able to do it. Very simple, but it was really satisfying. And from there, I bought a drum kit, listened to sort of, just old prog records and stuff and taught myself to play the drums and in bristol at the time there was a shortage of drummers sort of my age and i just got asked to join loads of bands um and from there it kind of snowballed really i mean i had rubbish jobs for years you know just doing call center work and and crap um but then gradually i started meeting more musicians and then slowly started playing gigs out of town and then got signed and then first international gig and then got signed again and picked up by, and it just kind of went on until I was touring the world for, for like months of the year like I was away for weeks and weeks at a time uh, and then like I said had children stopped because I didn't want to be away while they were growing up uh, retrained uh, and then I hated the jobs I did and I wasn't kind of built for being an adult <laughs> if that makes sense um, and so I I ended up in a design, electrical design job here in Bristol, which I just detested. Uh, but I was made redundant um, a few years ago. And I thought, well, now's really my chance to, to do something for me. And I kind of started tinkering, like I built the lathe already. I said, I kind of started tinkering before, but put it away. And I thought, maybe I should go back to this. And here I am, I don't know, four or five years later with a business, which I do full time. Oh, that's fantastic. What a great story. I, I, now I want to go back just a little bit and I want to hear a little bit about what it, what it was like for you to travel internationally to tour. Well, how, how was that? I guess, I guess what I want to frame it in is, was that like the peak for you? Was that the apex at that moment? Um, or did you have grander plans or how was I've that for you? Plans. I don't think I've ever had plans. <laughs> <laughs> That's been a kind of constant issue, to be honest. But I've always had this kind of thing, and there's a lot of psychology in it, I'm sure, which which is probably for a different podcast. But I tend to kind of put things ahead of me, and if you know what I mean, like just go. I'm just going to stay open to maybe something will happen, and I've been either extremely lucky or that has worked. And I've, you know, I I started by making these goals, and I thought I'm not going to make a, a crazy goal like. 
like I want a mansion by the time I'm 30 or anything, you know, why not? But I'm 41 now and that didn't happen. But I just thought when I was just playing in Bristol, I thought my goal this year is to play outside of Bristol. It's realistic. It might not happen. And then it did happen. I thought, great. My goal next year is to play internationally. I did. I did a gig in France. Great goal for the next year or the next goal that year, whatever was to play to tour the U S because you know, when you're, when you're sort of that age, English musician, you think, wow, tour America. Great. Um, and I did, and I've done that several times. And so I just kept setting these little goals, which were achievable, but not guaranteed. Um, How were yeah, they anyway. achievable? Well, I just thought there's no kind of reason why not, because things seem to be going okay. And I, I was with a lot of talented people, you know, uh, in bands, and I thought we seem to be doing the right thing. We're doing it for what I saw as the right reasons. Um, and yeah, it just sort of worked. But yeah, anyway, touring internationally. Um, what was the let question? Me, let me Present stop you one second, and let's. I do. I do want to ask. So, because I, I'm, I'm always trying to untangle the the luck from, from. You know, a dogged pursuit of of yeah. opportunity. So, yeah. if you're playing, you know, you you surrounded yourself with, uh, or you're in the company of talented musicians and skilled musicians, people who are committed. And I'm assuming you weren't just sitting in a garage somewhere, just, just playing and nobody knew about you. So, so you were, you were putting it out done, there. Yeah. I've done plenty of that. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, years, well years, yeah. Years, I mean, years. we all do the thing in our house, right. And we all do yeah, the thing yeah. we get together, but you guys were serious musicians and you were, you were looking for that opportunity. So how did, how did those connections happen that, that led you to these I think, contracts. I, I think a lot of it is to do with local scene, perhaps. Like like early on when I was, I guess, early twenties, there was a really, really good music scene in Bristol, meaning my band and other bands would just always play on each other's bills and then hang out together and and so it sort of became this group thing where we were all supporting each other, not just for the sake of it, you know, we all liked each other, we all had similar music tastes and, and stuff. And it just, I think it drew some attention. We, we then have friends who, I think some of it is kind of luck and who, who you know. We have friends who were in the music uh, industry in London, for example. And at the time, this was kind of before really the internet kicked off in the way it has. So, so the, the people there in London would send bands to us, to our little collective, like who are touring maybe from New York or something. And so, you know, we're just kind of spreads and you get this kind of network and then maybe a label manager will be at a gig and get interested and there, there comes this little kind of uh, buzz, I suppose. Um, but yeah, like I, there's definitely a sense that like you chase it by just sort of doing it, you know. Um, yeah, I, I was very lucky. One of the bands I was in, the the main, the lead guy, it was his project really, but um, he was very sort of driven. He was all about making the CDs and posting it off to, to labels and contacting people and, you know, playing that game in a genuine way. And it, and it worked. And he was extremely talented, which was obviously the major thing. Um, yeah. And so then the, the additional part of the question was, was how, how did it feel to achieve those those goals and to actually be touring? Like it was was it everything you thought it would be? Um, uh, that's a leading question, but I'll let you answer. Yeah, I think it was and more and and a bit less sometimes. It's it's weird because there I think there's very much uh, an image of what these things are. So you say like touring the world, it's like wow, and you talk to some people about it, parties and great times but and it is great i'm not downplaying anything i've done or the luck and the opportunities i've had but um it's a lot of reality kicks in when you when you've sat in airports for hours and hours like every day for for weeks again bigger problems in the world of course but you get really tired you know and there's you know the liver takes a battering and and you just for me anyway, before I knew it, I was exhausted and there's problems. Maybe the label aren't quite paying you enough. You know, this is very much the negative, the sort of downside, the, the unseen thing once you're actually in it that you don't kind of consider might actually happen before you go into it. Do you know what I mean? 
So, so yeah, touring, it was great. It was really, really good fun. I saw some absolutely incredible places and met some brilliant people, like made some friends for life. And, but there is definitely another side to it, which, which is you just get very tired and a bit jaded, if I'm honest. Um, yeah, the go, go, go is a young person's game, isn't it? It sure is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I look back on it fondly and I do miss it. But um, yeah, it's it's a strange one, really. It'd be nice if you could slot in a few weeks a year, right, just to do it. It doesn't seem to work like that generally, uh, but that would be nice. Yeah, I have I have joined another band in Brighton, actually, and we had a, a bunch of gigs lined up. We did a few before lockdown. Um, and then, you know, March, April came along and went, no yeah. way, we're not doing that. So so that's off the radar for now. Is it mostly Prague that you play? No, not at all. No, no, Prague was just what I happened to be listening to when I was kind of early teens, I guess. But but like kind of 70s King Crimson sort of Prague. Oh, yeah. 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 So that, that sort of era and that sort of vibe, like Bill Bruford style drumming and... and yeah, that kind of thing really spoke to me. But then I I just grew up with indie and metal. And, and then as I got older, I started listening to like Elliot Smith and electronic music like Apex Twin and, and just a bunch of crazy stuff. So yeah, I, I play all sorts, really, uh, if I like it. Just fun to play. Yeah, makes sense. So, yeah. so you, you, you've been traveling a while, uh, touring for a while. So does that mean that what, while you were touring, you obviously you weren't you weren't working in, in, back in England, uh, but when you I came, was a little bit to be honest. At, okay. At the beginning, yeah, <clears throat> I was very lucky. I worked as a picture framer, uh, and it was just the boss of the business and me. And he was so he was such. We became really good friends. And <laughs> I'd get a phone call at, at the picture framing business saying we've been offered a support slot with so and so. It's four weeks in Germany starting Monday. Can you do it? And I'm like, hang on, <laughs> just speak to the boss. And he goes, you know what? If you don't do it now, you'll, you'll regret it. Just go and I'll deal with the, the business. So, I was very so he was your advocate? Yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah, I, I owe him a lot really for that. Yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. And so at this point, you said you were married. Did you have a couple of kids at that point? Not at that point, no. No, okay. This I was married. And uh, the kids came sort of towards the end of the touring. I've been touring for some years, basically. Okay. Uh, so, so when, when did you, you know, make that decision then to be at home? Uh, how did that come about? So when I did a great big tour, which went around Europe and, uh, Scandinavia, US, South America, China, just all over the place. And my wife was pregnant and I obviously knew that, that things were going to change. And we had this discussion in the band that, that, well, you know, looking back now, it's, it seems a bit silly, but when the baby's born, we've got this big show in New York and then a big US tour. So just come along, bring the baby, bring, bring your wife, it'll be fine. And, and uh, <laughs> I'm not, not quite sure about that. Um, and I handed over the sticks to another drummer, um, but, but we did like two, uh, like two drummer gigs. We did a whole bunch of gigs together as two drummers and the idea was I would come back. But then I started thinking, I just started feeling a bit uneasy about it. It just didn't feel right. It might have been fine, but but I, my instinct at the time was I think I need to just be here um, and be with my children, you know, and help them grow and not be away for nine nine weeks, uh, you know, and then two months and whatever. Uh, yeah, so that was my decision. I, I got in touch with the band and said, look, uh, I'm not sure about this. Um, it was a bit of a funny one, but, you know, ultimately all good. Was it a tough decision? Kind of, because it suddenly meant I had to do something. I had to uh, get a job, basically. So so I, I remember I literally made the decision and then went, right, better get on the computer and find something. What, what could I do? I'm quite practical. I'm quite good with electrical stuff. And I searched for electrical courses and just got on one pretty quickly, basically. Uh, yeah, so it was all very quick. And then suddenly, before I knew it, I'd gone from touring you know, all these amazing exotic places. And then I was working in, in steel mills, like under the furnace wiring in temperature sensors in 150 degree heat. And it, yeah, it was wild, such change. Yeah, and then a lot of noise and spit up at home, right? All, all of that <laughs> with yeah. the little ones. <laughs> oh yeah, big time, yeah. Not, not an easy period, I must say. Yeah, yeah, little ones are challenging. 
Um, but but good, but good. I mean, I'm sure I, I uh, again, that's a leading statement. I, so I should ask you, um, you know, you had mentioned earlier just about, you know, kind of a, a broken home childhood. Um, yeah. So I bet you that played a, a large into your decision to stay home and be there and present for your kids. Yeah, I, I was kind of, that was kind of in my mind as I was saying it, if I'm honest, and that's very kind of uh, astute to to bring that up. But yeah, certainly, like, there is an element of not wanting to kind of repeat what was basically done to me and yeah i that i'm yeah that did drive me as well so there's the cat just going crazy for me <laughs> and to take care of the cat yeah your your kids won't they they won't forget that and they, they may not realize it until they're much older but they'll be greatly appreciative of what you did yeah so that's that's huge so <laughs> kudos to you oh thank um, you yeah yeah well I'm, I'm glad for for me and for them you know i love them to bits obviously so yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to miss it. And I love where I am now, so you know things kind of work somehow. Yeah, kids are kids are really good. I've got one, and I had him a little later in life. Um, I don't know if I'll leave this in or not, but he just got his uh, all his parts for his first gaming PC. So we were upstairs putting that together, watching YouTube he? videos. He's fourteen. Okay. And and he's just a blast. So you know, just again, just just to reiterate. I, I suspect you're you're a pretty excellent father and you're fun because you're creative and and yeah, just how you spoke about your granddad mm -hmm. I I you know thank God for him because he, yeah. he he I suspect he made a great impression in your life not just with uh, spending time and to build things but but he's probably pouring through you a little bit right now to your own kids so that's Completely. cool yeah. yeah yeah I mean yeah he he basically raised me from that that perspective like from mm -hmm. that perspective yeah that's funny you should say that and again you know you can keep this in or, or, mm. or not I, I really don't mind but we're having some kind of family um problems at the moment in a sort of health sense with one of the family members and so so myself and my sister in particular are talking a lot about that sort of thing uh, you know just who's the family and who's been important and my granddad was just the, the major part of my life and to be honest when he died that's another impact he, that he had basically yeah. when i was like 15 that just just not knocked me for years and years and years basically so yeah that's a tough one i'm sorry that's hard yeah yeah, yeah it has been but yeah that was like 25 years ago so you kind of learn to to just be with it i suppose do you know what I mean? Rather than get over it, I don't think there is much getting over sometimes. But no, I, I think that's a really good way of, of putting it. Mm. Um, so thanks for sharing that. I appreciate that. Oh, thanks for listening. It's not yeah. not TMI, is it? Not no, TMI Friday. no, not at all. I cool. well, I, I'm always happy to talk about these things, and I think not to kind of take a take focus off it but i think in terms of being creative and having business and stuff and i've said this on previous interviews and things but you're going to bring yourself into it you know and that's kind of the point i think uh, you know and so if you're kind of open with who you are and how you got to who you are or, or at least kind of open to exploring that then then i think that can reflect in your work in a sort of honesty and you know just something tangible being created from it if that makes any sense it does. I I was uh, a visual artist for for years, uh, you know, as as a child playing with it, of course, and then more seriously in my teen years, and then working in my late teens, in my twenties. But I I wasn't connected to my work emotionally, and I'm 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 a I'm a pragmatist and an optimist, but I'm also a, I'm I, I'm a romantic. I, I, I like to look at things in an artistic sense, um, but I was building things and sculpting and, you know, was designing. And so there was a, a kind of an engineering aspect to it, but it wasn't until, you know, my life, I had a marriage that fell apart. Uh, I was about 30. I, I was a large part of it. She was a large part of it. And I went into therapy for a while and, you know, I'm seeing this therapist for several months and, you know, I'm walking out with no answers. And I finally, I said, you need to tell me where I'm crazy. Please tell me where I'm crazy. Yeah, and yeah. she said, well, we're, we're out of time. I said, no, I'm not leaving. Like we've been doing this too long. I need something. Yeah. And she said, uh, she told me that I was um, codependent and I had low self-esteem. 
Okay. And, and I thought, right. well, that's a load of crap. Right. And then I went somewhere and I, I, you know, for that week in between, and I was thinking about it, I was like, oh my goodness, she's right. Oh, and that was man. painful, painful, yeah. Yeah. but good pain. It was yeah, good pain. Yeah, you needed to, you needed to know it. I did. And it wasn't until after that. And I think primarily with the codependent aspect mm. that uh, when I started to, you know, consider how I felt about things or how I could feel, because I kind of had to learn how I felt about things. Cause I guess the, the joke in psychotherapy is that um, when a, a codependent dies, someone else's life flashes before their eyes. <laughs> So yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we can, I'll probably get canceled if I say that out loud, but um, it was, it was wild to own those emotions. And then I noticed, I noticed a level up in my work, something right, okay. changed in my work, even That's the engineering, even, you know, all of that, there was something different. But you didn't, it's, you didn't force it then. Obviously you didn't think I feel this way, therefore I can mm -mm. take this forward into my work. You noticed. I mean, I probably changing. You know, I probably like a child learning, you're kind of, you know, stumbling around and, and all, yeah. but, but I think, I think I was, I, I was also into my thirties and I was settling a little bit. And, um, I think for me, it was, um, it was just about being honest and not forcing anything. I didn't want to force it. I wanted it to be real. Yeah. And, and so that was, that was how it played out for me. Sure. That's interesting. Yeah. And so where are you now with that? If you don't mind me turning the question on to you. Like. Um, I think I'm really good with it. You know, I think if I, if I hadn't done that work, you know, I wouldn't be the husband that I am to my wife right now. I wouldn't be the friend and partner to her that I am. Yeah. Uh, I'd probably be a lot more insecure and a lot more selfish. And I, I don't know that I would have had the time for my son that I've had. I mean, I love him. I love hanging out with him. I love listening to him. I, I love, uh, I, you know, I love wrestling. You know, it's just, I'm present. I'm more present than I've ever been. And yeah, even with clients, you know, and even with you right now, I mean, I, I like to really hear how people are, how their life is, how, how are you and what's going on inside of you. Obviously we don't know each other. Right. But, right. but it's the start of something and that's cool. cool. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I, I, I just, I can see, I could see the little boy in you with your granddad out making the things, you know, I can imagine, right? Sure, yeah. And that's, that's a powerful and special relationship and a period of time. And, you know, it made me think of my dad because my dad was like that. And being British, my dad, you know, when, when um, my sister's much older than me and so she's had, her, her kids have been alive a lot longer than mine. He's been granddad forever now. And uh, he was an excellent granddad. So, yeah. So, yeah. So there you go. Yeah. So thanks for asking those questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all good. Yeah. So when you came back and now you're, you're staying home and uh, you're present with the family and you're working as uh, an electrical engineer of sorts, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, how did, how did the, the, how did the symbol turn for you? Like, where did that come into play? And how long were you turning that over in your head for? Uh, again, I, I'm not really, I didn't really make the plan. I, I, so being a drummer, to me, it was always the symbol or the symbols that were the real kind of instrument. It, like the real, the real expressive uh, sort of deep musical instrument. Um, just, a, you know, as part of the kit. And so I started just buying Turkish hand hammered symbols as a few companies were, were kind of coming along and just really getting into Turkish hand hammered sounds rather than the kind of big companies. There's a few big companies who make lovely symbols, but they're very much kind of machine made and very consistent, which is fine. But I like the, the kind of inconsistencies that, that you get in a handmade thing or the, the kind of uniqueness. Um, and I gone onto this forum uh, called Symbolholic, which is, is as it sounds, just a bunch of people talking about how much they love symbols. It's actually dormant at the moment, but I think it's archived. I think you can read what's, what was there until it was shut down. Um, and on there, there are people just 
just going crazy for, for like historical symbols on old jazz records and stuff. And I started reading about a few, just a, a real few people uh, kind of dotted around the planet making symbols by hand, either from raw material or kind of reworking off the shelf symbols. And that just, I guess that just kind of planted a seed for me, just this idea that you could actually make the things. And there was the most, most famously in those kind of circles, um, it was a guy called Roberto Spizzacchino, this Italian guy who used to work for one of the kind of mid-level uh, Italian companies, quite big company actually. Uh, and then just went, went off and did it by himself. And he lived in the mountains in Italy and just sat in his workshop in his garage, I think, and just hammered symbols. And I started seeing a few videos of that and that just really appealed to me. Just, just the kind of working alone to create some stuff. Um, and yeah, I just, having that thought, it's almost like I challenged myself to do it. I, I have this kind of streak of like, I've thought something now and I want to know how to do it. I want to kind of unpick it. Do you, if the, does that make sense? So, so I just started reading up on how, how you do it, what tools you need. And it turns out you need tools you can't really buy off the shelf. So I thought, right, well, how do I make the tools? And then I just started hitting... I sourced some blanks from one of the Turkish companies, these, you know, just blank raw discs. And I just started hitting it and just making mistakes and learning as I went. And it became, I suppose it became a, an obsession, really. Now that I think about it, I am kind of obsessed with it. I'm not into the whole historical symbol angle, but the making of it, the process, the production is, has kind of become what I am in a way. It's, it's what I do day to day. Uh, and yeah, I just, with every kind of the first time I hit a symbol, it's like, wow, I've hit a symbol and it makes a slightly different noise. Then I'd make a symbol that took weeks to finish and it didn't really sound very good, but I might have slightly unpicked a problem from the previous symbol and went, oh, okay, well, well, let's try again. And just on and on and on it went. The problems got finer and finer and they still are. You know, you clear one hurdle and there's a, another slightly smaller hurdle. Um, and yeah, that's, that just suits, again, suits the way my brain works. And, uh, and now I make a living off it. So, so, you know, I really can't complain at that. So when did you start making the living? When, when did it, it switch gears from well, hobby? I kind, of, I kind of had to when, when I got made redundant from the electrical design job. Uh, and I, I, did you I see that coming or was it sudden? The, the redundancy? I mean, I could see I didn't want to be there. And I think the reason I was made redundant was because so could my bosses. <laughs> But the, the company was, I just, it was, I think it's the same everywhere. The politics and just the, the mood of the place was just sour and it was horrible. Um, and then one morning I went in and spoke to one of the girls in the warehouse who was doing some wiring, uh, in the workshop bit, sorry, doing some wiring. And she went, oh, have you heard about, heard about who's going? I was like, oh, okay. And she went, what? No, no, probably not you. And I just went up and sat at my desk and just waited. And because uh, it was literally 11 weeks, uh, 11 months and three weeks after I joined. And if they, if you, if they make someone redundant after 12, after 12 months, they have to pay a certain amount of salary. So I thought, well, I'm definitely like last in first out sort of thing. And I just sat there, arms crossed, just waiting. And then uh, boss just kind of opened the door and went, oh, Dave, can we have a word, please? And I just laughed and just went, yeah, of course you can. Um, so, yeah, um, so that happened. And then I just thought, right. That something has to work but at the time my wife at the time was was kind of struggling with childcare for various reasons I won't go too deep into it um she was doing the stay at, you know the classic stay at home and I was earning the earning a crust and we owned a house um and we kind of talked about swapping roles because I thought maybe I was a bit not better suited but I was maybe more able to kind of handle the day-to-day -day of looking after two young boys I guess um and I hated my job and she wanted to go back to work so we we changed so I wasn't really making a living for a while but then I started selling some and people going yeah these sound really good really unique and and then suddenly I found myself in a new workshop and I had enough money to upgrade tools and so on. that point that point of that first sale that's usually a really sensitive spot for people I mean a spot mm -hmm. that people realize maybe they're there and then they run from it or they're frightened of it how, right. how did you know it was time to sell and how did that come about? That's a very good question. I'm not sure. 
if I'm honest. Um, I think what I had started doing was documenting in a way on Instagram. I had an Instagram account and thought this would be just, you know, an interesting thing. And if I am going to have a business, let's, let's start kind of shouting about it in whatever small way. Um, and I guess, I think someone just, was it a local, there, there's two symbols in particular I can think of. It was one of one or the other. Um, one went to a local drummer who came to the workshop and went, that's really nice, I'll buy that. In a way, I was a bit like, what, really? It's like, he, because he knew I existed, he came to me and suddenly I had a sale. It's like, oh, okay, that's how it works. Um, but the other one I'm thinking of, which probably thinking about it wasn't the first one, was I put a video of one of them up on my Instagram uh, and this guy in Japan just just went. I want that. How much is it? So I figured it out, and and it went off to Japan. So for a, either a first or second sale, I was like, okay, right. If I sort of play my cards right, maybe there is money to be made here, and you know, a living I can have that I'm going to enjoy doing. So how how did it build from there? Um, I think probably a lot of word of mouth locally. I had a lot of people coming. Uh, from the local scene so this was long after I'd stopped playing kind of locally and then I went off internationally and, and there were all these new young musicians coming through you know probably in the same situation I was in 10 whatever years ago before, like previously and suddenly all these drummers were coming to the workshop just if nothing else just purely interested in the fact that there was someone in their city that made cymbals and then they started playing them and going wow that's really interesting I'll take that one. How much is that? And and that started happening. And then I'd get an email saying, my friend in Bristol told me that you sell and you make and so on and so on. So then I made a website and started putting them up and gradually word spread, I suppose. So yeah, kind of organically in that sense. So you, you've got this, um, we'll say an organic situation going on. You're, you're kind of a, uh, a mad engineer, right? I guess it's a romantic way of putting it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. putting yeah. things together. And I just, for my, for my benefit, I'm, I'm trying to imagine you working on a symbol and you must have, you must have an idea of what you want it to sound like and, and how you want to massage it toward a sound or maybe not. I, I don't know. Sometimes. I, I think when I was learning, it was more that I just, part of the struggle when you're learning is getting a, a nice shape. And like, I'm all very much, it's not about the visual, it's not about the visual, but there is an, you know, the shape equates to the sound. If it's nicely shaped and nicely tensioned, it, it'll sound nice. That's not to say a symbol that doesn't, you know, sit perfectly flat on the surface if it's all like, like a taco can still sound beautiful but it's part of the process it's like it's it's doable so so I was like I'm gonna try and figure out how to do that which which I have um, but when I was learning it was more that I'd go for that and then the sound would feed back to me what I'd done to it if you see where I'm coming from so I wasn't really chasing a sound as such um, rather seeing what sound I get from doing a certain thing and so it's almost like these days I kind of let the process lead me a little bit. It depends when you get the, the raw uh, material, there's a certain sound in that material already based on the way it's produced and loads of factors. So you have to work with that. But yeah, these days I'd say I do design a, a bit more, you know, I'm with a certain weight blank, like so many grams or whatever, uh, at a certain diameter, maybe I'll try for this kind of sound. So, so it has become a design thing purely led by doing it blind well and you you have to have a level of mastery at it now where yeah where you, yeah 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 i i think yeah i'm confident enough to say i do but also that that idea of um ever kind of small ever smaller hurdles you know there's always things once i reach a point of going oh, i've worked that out and usually it's not conscious i'll, I'll kind of get too I'll get a bit, not lazy, but but I'll just keep doing that. And then I'll kind of lose it a little bit and, and get frustrated and and then tr sort of try something else and that'll work. And then I tie those two things together to then move on to the next, the next. 
it, I think it's all based on my my brain. I, I I do it with everything. Like if I if I learn to do something, that whatever it is, I, I'll do it really well for a little while. Then I'll kind of overthink it and lose it and get frustrated, and then I'll come back to it and be able to do it quite well. And I think that's my subconscious just kind of chewing it over and dealing with it. That's, that's really think, cool. Yeah. yeah, I think maybe I'm just in complete denial about the fact that I'm a control freak or something. But well, but you 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 know yourself. Yeah, uh, I, I imagine best, and and so it's almost like you've got this little kind of a parabola that yeah. goes on. You do it, you get good, you lose it for a bit, you leave it. Your subconscious is working on it, and then it brings Absolutely. it back together. You know, I think about that on pieces that I'm working on when I'm, you know, I, I don't necessarily I'm not hitting the likeness on a portrait. And it's usually because I'm too close to it. But then I go to yeah, sleep sure. and I wake up the next day and I can see what's wrong and then I can I can address it. I completely get that. I know exactly yeah. what you mean. But then do you, because what I find, not so much now because that's part of the process I've learned as well, is not to sit there and try and try and try and yeah. try. Especially yeah. when, you know, relatively it's, there's going to be different things for everyone. But when you're hitting a piece of metal to make a symbol, if you overdo it, and you crack it or something that's gone that's the end of it which could be a valuable lesson but also very expensive valuable lesson um yeah but the best thing i've taught myself if i'm getting frustrated or tired whatever put the hammer down go and have a walk have a cup of coffee yeah go and talk talk to someone else at the you know the estate where my workshop is and come back to it an hour later a day later and somehow i can see it like you said i, I can kind of see and just know what to do instinctively which is great yeah. but you have to kind of separate yourself out and rely on something that's that's kind of you but you're also not consciously in control of yeah which is a, something to learn i'd say yeah yeah it's a way it's a way of being yeah. i think yeah. and and you can um you you can you can grind you you can hit the brakes for too long too hard while you're hitting the gas and that can be trouble you know deadlines deadlines are another thing you know i've i've had that happen when i'm i'm in the midst of a deadline and it's just not working but you've got to answer the bell you have to sort it out and there's a it's almost like a different part of the subconscious comes into play there because mm. i've not missed a deadline and i've i've you know, been involved independently or with teams where we're trying to hit a deadline. And it almost looks like you're going to go over the cliff and then somehow mm. you, you pull it out. And I, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know how to answer that, but it just I find, works. I, I, yeah, I find that I was talking to someone about that a while ago. It's really, I find it very interesting that the majority of the time, the work you're set takes the time you're given almost to the, to the second, you know it's kind of when you think about it it's strange like okay people know their job and they know how long a process should take but but yeah something does just kind of kick in and get the job done at the right time not every time of course but but yeah i do find that kind of funny there's there's something driving that in the hmm. in the recesses of the mind i think yeah so uh, as far as your workload goes when when you're working on symbols i, I mean how many do you have going at once Oh gosh, at the moment I've got lots, lots and lots. I mean, this COVID thing, this lockdown, I've never been busier, yeah. which is great. You know, yeah. I, I, I'd much rather people weren't dying in their thousands, but that given yeah. like people are buying symbols, I guess folks are at home and you know, they've maybe got drum kits they want to show off online or, or whatever. So they're commissioning me to make them or they're buying off my site uh yeah so so it's just going really well i've got tons on so a lot of commissions like i said uh and then i just like to buy random i i order blanks by by weight and diameter so i'll just kind of throw a few in just to cut just for fun and see what i can come up with really so i've got a whole stack of those waiting in the workshop it's just i love looking at your instagram i love it i lo you're a sculptor you're you're an engineer you're a musician and you're a sculptor That's and i I, I could see, I can see the ripples in the symbols, but then I can see the hammer. Yeah. And then I like, I like your logo on there as well. Uh, I don't, do you spray that on? 
it's ink it's an ink, ink. stamp actually yeah okay. that's that's really a new thing i've been kind of allergic to branding and stuff which i think is a confidence issue at, at root but um i kind of haven't known the best way to do it the the whole branding thing for a long time because i mean i again i go into this in some depth with in other interviews and and whatever but uh, there's so many there's the same with any product there's symbol companies who just it's all about the branding and and they they buy like chinese made symbols that one of the factories produce for them and then slap their own logo on and then sell 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 and fine they do very well and i i don't like that um so yeah I've, it's kind of i've not known how to present myself but recently i've kind of found a way to do it i settled on the logo a while ago right? i love the logo I'm, i just pulled you up on instagram that's why i'm looking okay. away yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I love the logo i like that you've got collingwood right on there i think that's that's the way to go i think that's like uh, and you can cut this out if i'm just rambling that's just cut me off but um the thing with the logo that's another one of those situations where i, I, I had to do something like and and got it done um because i didn't even have a logo for a long time and then i i took my girlfriend away for her birthday uh to a hotel in wales um and it came to pay on the the morning at the end of the weekend and i didn't have any money and i i just I just like sank and felt kind of embarrassed and like failure and all this kind of stuff. I had to borrow money from my mum and you know, all the, all the stuff that comes with that. And I just thought I can't, I can't be in this situation. Like I just need to sort of do a few things I've been putting off and just try and do something just to make myself feel better and take a step. So we drove kind of halfway back to Bristol from, from Wales where we were and stopped in a cafe and just sat there for hours. And I thought, what, what can I do to just kind of at least start something to turn something around and feel like I'm doing something. And I thought, let's design a logo. Let, let's do that. And I just sat there for ages just doodling and sketching and then just kind of came up with the idea of the two C's kind of within each other. And I thought that's quite good. So I sketched it out and I thought, what if it's just four circles four gradually kind of increasing circles and I just chopped the edge off. So I drew that and it looked really good. And then I came home and I opened up Photoshop and I tried to be really clever. I thought, right, the first circle will be this diameter and then I'll use like the golden ratio to make the others and it'll look all proper and great. And it just just didn't look at all right until I literally measured the sketch I'd done on the piece of paper and then just recreated that in Photoshop and it just, that was it. Job done. So you made your logo. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> Thanks. Cause you won't find me going out and making a symbol. <laughs> I, I won't be able to manage it. Oh no. I think, I think it's just, brilliant. I was waiting for you to tell me that you went on Fiverr or you did. And so I just, I love all of that. Cool. Um, yeah. Kind of self self-made. Yeah. And you know, so for, for followers of the breakthrough creative, um, Dave's sister is uh, Kate. Uh, so sorry. Satorius, who was uh, my, my second guest, fourth, fourth episode, and she is a uh, cake topper uh, sculptor. And I, I mean, and she's a baker and she does all this stuff, but that's kind of her, her uh, wheelhouse. And, you know, I, I found Dave through Kate, and they grew up in Bristol uh, at a time when Ardman Animation, you, you guys were friends with the, the, the kids of the owners is that correct or yeah i was one of the sons of peter lord was in my class and we were quite good friends so i'd be around at their house all the time and visiting the Ardman studios sort of after hours just just for fun you know as we could and B banksy comes out of bristol banksy was not very well known correct when when you were young well certainly not to me like yeah. i i think yeah probably not i'm yeah, I'm not a fan of Banksy, I've got to say. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, fan or not, it, it seems like that was like a creative hotbed uh, between, between you know, those two studios, but then bands and artists. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. There was a lot happening hand in hand. So I guess thinking the Banksy side of things, there's Massive Attack and Portishead all doing their, their trip hop kind of music that, that was very, very well known at the time. Yeah, there was lots and lots and lots going on. Yeah. Do you think there some? Was, of... There always has been, I'd say. 
the, well, I was going to ask, you know, kind of growing up in that world and then your granddad taking an interest in you and making things with you. And then, you know, there, there's a, there's a fearlessness to you um, in regard to trying something new and, and figuring out a way. I mean, one of the things that came to mind when you said uh, earlier um, that you didn't have, you needed a lathe, you knew you needed a lathe. And you, you actually talk about the tools. You knew that there weren't tools, you'd have to make the tools. Mm -hmm. And I, there's, there's just, a, I think, a, a roadblock for, for many who don't go that extra step to say, all right, well, if I'm gonna make this, I need the tools. Oh, there's no tools available. Yeah. Oh, I guess I can't make it now, I'm, I'm done. And they fade off. And that doesn't yeah. seem to live in you. Th yeah, I, that's interesting. The, the word fearless kind of spoke to me because if I seem fearless about it, then I'm bullshitting you. Sorry, you, you bleep that or delete it or whatever, but I'm, I'm making it up because I'm terrified of life, you know? <laughs> I yeah I'm very afraid of like failing and the way I'm sort of perceived I suppose if I'm if I'm brutally honest but what kind of what what would failing be like what I define don't know. that I really don't know I have no idea I think this comes from a lot of very early stuff it, it's not necessarily got um got a sort of image attached to it if you to the email if you know what I mean yeah, I don't know. I don't know, but it's it's just in my nature. But I think maybe that also is why I tend to succeed in a lot of things I try to do. You know, yeah. It's I don't know. I don't understand that if I'm honest. Yeah, oh, that's that's really good because I I I think there's a there's a uh, I have a fear of failure too, and I don't know that I can define it. Right. I I don't even know what it what it would look like. Yeah. Um, is it a personal thing? Like, would it involve other people? I, th I think it has to. I think it, yeah. I think it has to be, there's something about maybe being a disappointment or, right. or, yeah. you know, fa failure to me would be missing a client's deadline. You know, that would be, that would be an issue. And I have in the past described deadlines as relationships. So it must have something to do with relationship because I, you know, yeah, yeah. deadlines, I, I was, I was on a panel and, and we were talking about clients and we were talking about deadlines and they were asking everybody, what, what do you think of deadlines? And when they came to me, I had not premeditated my response. It just came pouring out of me. I said, deadlines are relationships because right. if somebody is trusting me to meet their needs and I, I make a commitment to do it and then I don't. I'm going to feel terrible mm. because, and I'm also, it's not going to be good for business. There's so many things attached to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think, I think there's something about that because I know when I, I can have a project that's due in 20 hours. And if I know, if I know the path to finishing it, I'm fine. I can stay up all night and do it. If I don't have the answers, that's when I get anxious and that's when right. I get a little fearful. Because there's procrastinate as well as a result. Uh, I I in your... I have yeah. I I used to have so so much work lined up. I would look at my list in the morning, and my heart would race because I wouldn't know how I was going to get it all done, and I wouldn't know yeah. where to start. And it wasn't yeah. until about an hour of looking at it and procrastination, I said, "Well, I better do something." Yeah, and, exactly. you know and yeah. and then then things would just get done again yeah i i relate to that in a, in a big way definitely but i th uh, again like i kind of alluded to the fact that that we've got some family stuff going on at the moment yeah but it's it i mean it often takes quite a sort of big shocking important thing for for you to get a bit of perspective in life you know and sort of remember oh god yeah there's bigger things going on here um anyway so since you know having that news and we're still going through it but i i've kind of i've got so many i've got a little folder with all my commissions written out on each on a sheet of paper and all the blanks just sat in the workshop and i get through them it's fine i'm, I'm doing fine with them but i i do exactly like you said i kind of sit at my, my desk in the workshop make a coffee and just look at it all and then make another coffee and look at it all a little bit more but but now, anyway, since this kind of 
something big is going on, I'm like, okay, come on, just, and it's control, you know, it's complete kind of displacement of control over a situation I can't control, I think, but I can sit down now and I've just laid everything out, all my paperwork's in front of the relevant piece of material and, and it just makes so much sense all of a sudden. And then there's like, well, why didn't I do this last week? <laughs> you know, but, but hey ho, there we go. So, uh, you know, a little bit more pragmatic of a question. What, what are your income streams? Like, is it, is it all symbols? Is it, is there anything else in there? Majority symbols. Yeah, basically. Um, I, I do okay out of that. I pay the rent, uh, which is nice. Um, also, I get royalties from all the records I've played on. So every three months I get a royalty payment into my bank account. Uh, so yeah, I guess I've been on, played on maybe 30, 40 records, including like compilations and, you know, festival kind of here's who's on the bill kind of CDs. Um, yeah. And if something gets used on TV, played on the radio, in a film, I'll, I'll get, I'll get a nice chunk of cash from that which oh, is a nice good. little bonus. Yeah. And often I forget it's coming and then I look at my bank account and, and punch the sky. <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent. I'd like to be uh, sitting across the street as you do that in the air and go, Oh, yeah. Dave must have gotten a, a residual. <laughs> yeah, I've got five pounds. No, it's, it can be quite good. <laughs> like if we, I, one of the bands I was in, they, um, a German production, like film production company, picked up a, a record that we'd done, and they used a lot of it on this great big film that was released one year. It was German language, so it wasn't kind of an international smash or anything, but it was big in Germany, and that was really lucrative for me and for the rest of the band. That was that was really great. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. Um, how, how did you figure out how to price your symbols? Oh, I think I'm still figuring that out. If I'm yeah. honest. Um, yeah uh that what i tend to what i try to do i try to price really fairly based upon obviously the material and the time and and things um and where i think i am as an artisan you know and what i should be charging for the the time i spend making it but also the time i spent learning to make it you know and what i do is very very niche um so yeah there was a time where people were saying look your prices are just too low that you, sh you could be earning more and you should be charging more. Like it's fair to you and kind of in a way it's fair to the customer and like the, do you, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. So, so I did. Yeah. I, I kind of thought about it and I put up, uh, you know, I kind of made sense of it. I didn't just go, I'll slap a hundred pounds on it and hope for the best. And that nothing changed in the sense that people kept buying them and appreciating them. And that's kind of, I think where I got more confidence to like start stamping the logo and all this kind of stuff. But you know, material prices change, so I have to keep on top of that. It depends on the size of the symbol. Like, so, so on my Instagram, for example, you'll see some of them are shiny where I've laid off the surface to whatever degree. Some aren't, they're very kind of dull and dry. So they might take less work. So they might be sort of priced lower um, in that respect. Also, I have to think about tax and food. <laughs> I quite like food, so. so um, <laughs> Yeah, just have to think about all these things. I'm not a businessman. I really am not, and I've struggled with that side of things. But then I went for a kind of free business course in Bristol a few months ago before lockdown, and that just kind of opened my eyes uh, to it and then had like some one-on-one -on -one consultations with this woman who was just great uh, and just kind of said, why are you doing this? Why aren't you doing this? You know, just kind of get on with it almost. <laughs> just stop being silly. Just do these business things then they'll be done then you can carry on making the things and she really helped me um so yeah i i think for anyone starting a business and it's probably obvious but my business started with an idea and then me just swinging hammers you know not like i'm going to build a business but like reaching out for professional help from someone who just knows the system you know like how to just do a spreadsheet of income and outgoings and stuff has just been invaluable really yeah, you, you saying that made me remember I've got to reach out to my accountant after this because he's waiting on some things for me. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's good to have uh, professionals in your back pocket doing the things that, that need to be done that, that you either A, don't need to be doing or B, can't do. <laughs> Quite right, yeah. yeah. Apart from your granddad, were there any mentors in your life that, that 
you know, are impacting you today. Like either they're in your life now or they were in your life and you're able to do the stuff you do because they were so impactful mm. to you. So in a, in a personal sense or in any sense? Yeah, any. I'd say, uh, I think he was kind of the biggest one uh, in making me who I am. Not, And I don't kind of mean in the sense that he kind of, consciously thought I'm going to do the right thing to build him as a man and he probably he probably did to a degree because I didn't have a dad there I I should say I have a stepdad who's great as well like you know but my granddad just basically stepped in when my dad left and so we became very strong you know anyway so so yeah he um he impacted me a lot in that way but he was also quite sort of quite a a bit of a quiet man and he was always ill I seem to remember or, um, the rest of my family were very much like, oh, isn't he so, isn't he amazing? He's always kind of in pain, but he just gets on with it. And to be honest, I think that gave me a little bit of a, a sort of martyr thing. Like you have to kind of suffer to achieve in a way. In terms of people who are still alive, like I say, my stepdad, he, he came in and was just really supportive. Like when, and my mom, you know, when I live with them uh, at home uh, here in Bristol still, um, and I started to play the drums. Never did they say stop playing because we're going crazy. They were so, they, I think they were just happy, A, that I was in the house and not just on the streets somewhere. And and B, kind of expressing myself. And they were really supportive in that respect. Um, but as for other mentors, I think maybe I've kind of, I, my mind's just gone to like drumming basically and, and taking inspiration from drummers. So, so I guess I'll mention that, like just listening to records and music was such a big inspiration. Um, and again, tying that back, my, my folks were just really supportive with that as well, you know, driving me to gigs and driving all my gear to gigs and picking me up at 12 at night and stuff when I was 14 years old. So, yeah. Boy, that means a lot. That's, that's yeah. powerful. That's powerful yeah. stuff. Thank mm. goodness for them. Um, Absolutely. So, so then, yeah, as we wrap up, uh, what, what advice might you have for the artist who's listening right now and has, has some kind of inkling or dream to start their own business, to make a living doing what it is that they do? I mean, I guess if it's doing what it is that they love, really, I'd, I'd say go for it, you know. Uh, I'd also say from my perspective again i didn't kind of plan to do it but i think that word inkling it, like that you said is is quite a sort of big one like if you if you're doing something if you are artistic creative in whatever way and you just think you know what i could actually enjoy a life of this and i want to do this and i'm driven to do this for reasons you may or may not understand i think it's probably worth following um because otherwise, I think it'll just always be there, you know, as something that you want to do and don't, and that's just not healthy. So I'd say probably you can make your own luck a lot, if you see what I mean. Like I was saying earlier about setting goals, and I've known a lot of the right people. I've been, I've had luck, I, I fully accept, but just kind of following your nose and believing in yourself, if at all possible, um, can lead to good places just like try um, and then if it doesn't work don't give up like oh there's no tools to make symbols forget it like well okay what's the bat what's the missing part here the tool let's make the tool you know i haven't got a, a pencil and i want to draw someone well is there like a rock about and a you know a bit of chalk or something just that there's a way i've got i've got a motto basically which is there is always a way and like I probably need to remind myself of that a lot of the time, uh, like every day. But I, I truly believe there is always a way if, if you want something to kind of figure it out and what you want might change on the way and that's okay. Do you know what I mean? Just kind of start on the road, basically. Put a foot forward. It sounds so kind of trite in a way, so if that's the right word, but, but I think there's a lot to that. Oh, man, I think, I think there's everything to that because and anybody's journey if you don't if you don't start on the path you're not going to figure it out sure. you're just not going to figure it out I, it's like driving a car and yeah. you know you're you're constantly you don't just hold the wheel in one position you're constantly 
adjusting and readjusting the wheel because mm -hmm. the road is uneven and the car leans or the road leans right. or there's a hole in the road or you know you have to turn left i mean you're constantly adjusting yeah. and you're not going to get anywhere if if you're frightened of 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 the adjusting of that wheel so. yeah i i think a bit, a bit of fear like we were talking about earlier can be healthy or just normal you know to be expected i i must say as well like it's all well and good for me to say just start but perhaps there's other pressures in someone's life that have nothing to do with the creative process that they enjoy whatever it may be that might be holding them back for other reasons in which case perhaps that's the road that needs to be kind of started on and hopefully alongside the things that they enjoy and feel kind of driven to do can blossom and that might help drive you know becomes this kind of positive feedback cycle i'd say basically as well seek help and i mean that in a big way and a small way if if you're kind of stuck i'm i'm quite bloody minded in that i won't ask for help like i am 100 percent self-taught drummer 100 percent self-taught symbol maker because i kind of want i want it to be me i want it to be mine and i kind of i kind of reject help a little bit which again i think goes way way back to a lot of this family stuff we've talked about um but i'd say again tying something else in there are professionals out there if it's personal thing get personal professional help if it's if you don't know what kind of pencil you need to draw a picture ask an artist or go to a go to an art store you know and everything in between uh, yeah. and then get on get on podcasts and ramble on at the host <laughs> please do <laughs> that's great advice thanks so much um where where can people find you okay so mainly my website is collingwoodsymbols.com and it's not i get so many emails just to drag this on saying hi colin how are you i'd love to try <laughs> colin wood no it's dave collingwood so it's collingwoodsymbols.com uh i'm on instagram at collingwood symbols and i'm pretty active on there uh, I, I do have a Facebook page, which I don't use as much, but I should really do because uh, I left Facebook on a sort of personal level just because I can't stand it. Uh, yeah, and that's kind of it. And I can be contacted through all those means and I'm always happy to talk symbols or life or cats or whatever, you know, I'm perfectly approachable. Uh, yeah, so reach out. Excellent. Thanks so much, Dave. I really appreciate you. your uh, story and your input and your advice and your thoughts and your honesty. Well, I, to be, if I'm honest, I wasn't expecting such a, a kind of probing interview, but I, I'm, that's the real deal for me. I, I've really enjoyed it. Like, I'm more than happy to talk this way. So, yeah, good stuff. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. I appreciate it. Thanks again, Dave, for being my guest this week. I really appreciate all that you shared about your career of touring, your career of symbol smithing, and uh, the more personal side of you. It is rare and unusual, I think, to have a conversation like we just had. And I encourage all of you out there, you know, take a look at that deeper stuff. Um, sometimes you can do that with your friends, you can do it with a diary, you can do it with family, you can do it with uh, a trusted professional. And I would encourage you that it should be somebody who is trustworthy. You don't just want to share all of your stuff with just anybody. Um, and that might mean, you know, Facebook and Twitter. I don't know that you want to go too public with, with <laughs> all the personal stuff. But uh, yeah, so Dave, that was, that was really awesome. And thanks for sharing you know, just how how you made your way into symbol smithing. One thing that I see as a thread amongst, I think, everybody that I have interviewed so far, and I've certainly experienced it myself, is that there is a, a desire to create in a very specific way, in a very specific manner. Um, and there isn't always a clear-cut answer. So the first thing that happens is, is the entrepreneur who is creative or happens to be creative in our, our world, uh, makes a commitment to the desire that they have. Like, it's like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to figure out a way. So there was no lathe that 
absolutely worked for turning symbols, for turning the metal to make symbols. So what did Dave do? Well, he went and built one. How many people do you know who have gone out and built a lathe? He went and figured it out. And then he said at some point there weren't tools. So he, he could have just stopped right there, but he went and he made the tools. So what is stopping you? What is getting in your way that is, is preventing you from pursuing your career and your creative dreams? Because I bet you, I bet you there's an answer. I bet you there's a way around it, a way to figure out what it is that you are going to do and so that you can be successful, okay? So, so don't just give up, keep going after it. And if you're anything like, you know, any of the guests that I've had so far, and I bet there are a lot of you who are, you're not gonna let anything stop you. Okay? You're not going to let those, those things that are kind of, they're not, they're not easy to overcome necessarily, but they're certainly not insurmountable. So I highly, highly recommend that you figure out a way. Maybe that's the best way to say it. You figure out a way. So with that being said, uh, I'm going to wrap this week's show, but I do want to let you know that next week our guest is going to be Deb Oliver who is an incredible portrait artist. And if you want to get a jump on her uh, work uh, and maybe do a little look and to see what she does, she is on Instagram at the monkey brush. Yes, I'm telling you the truth. The monkey brush. T-H-E-M-O-N-K-E-Y-B-R-U-S-H. You are going to be astonished at the portraits that cr she creates digitally. Um, and, and it's when I say digitally, she's not manipulating, like she's creating, she's painting these things. It just happens that her brush is dipped into pixels, particularly in the program of Procreate. So if you have any friends who are artists, who are visual artists, who work in Procreate or portrait artists, I, I highly recommend that uh, you check in for her episode next week. So on behalf of the Breakthrough Creative, I am John McDavitt. And I hope that you're going to go ahead and get busy about the serious business of making art and making a living from that art. Have an awesome day.